Kia ora katoa katoa. Ko tu Turanga Associate Chief Librarian, Te Puna Mataranga o Aotearoa. Hello, um, welcome, it's nice to see you. My name is Jessica Moran. I am the Associate Chief Librarian at the Alexander Turnbull Library at the National Library of New Zealand. Um, that's just a quick introduction to myself and I will hand over to Mark who will actually be starting the presentation this morning or this evening, depending on where in the world you are right now. <laughs> Thanks Jess. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Mark Crookston toko ingoa, ko Tuturanga Program Director, Documentary Heritage, o Te Puna Maturanga o Aotearoa. Um, my name is Mark and I'm the Program Director, Documentary Heritage at the, at the National Library of New Zealand. My immediate previous role is the role that Jess is in now, Associate Chief Librarian of the Turnbull Library. And we just changed over recently. So this feels like, in doing this together, this feels like a very public kind of like handover session. <laughs> um, um, so thank you all for um, uh, for participating, for for listening and for watching. And, and, a, and, a, and a big thank you to, um, um, to the Research Libraries uh, UK, um, crew for, for hosting us and, and being so welcoming for us. On with the show. The Alexander Turnbull Library is a research library that is part of the National Library of New Zealand. Uh, our mandate includes the development of research collections and services, particularly in the fields of New Zealand and Pacific studies, um, developing and maintaining a comprehensive collection of documents relating to New Zealand and the people of New Zealand. Um, and as part of the National Library, we have a clear mandate to work collaboratively with other institutions having similar purposes, including those forming part of the international library community. Um, so this is Jess and I here really um, engaging with you guys as part of our mandate. So that's cool. Just over 100 years ago, Alexander Turnbull, that's that handsome chap on the screen that you can see, um, he was a collector and bibliophile. He died. Um, and bequeathed what was then the largest private, private collection in New Zealand to the people of New Zealand via the Crown. Just over 50 years ago, the library was integrated into the then new National Library of New Zealand. And while centenaries are often a time for reflection and celebration, the Turnbull Library used its past to look forward and consider the kind of library it will be in the future and the kinds of collections and services necessary to fill its mandate. This presentation reflects on just a few shifts the Turnbull has made to address challenges and opportunities presented by digital, with a focus on access, digitization, appraisal and collection development, and how our digital shift and how our, our deliberate shift to create a more inclusive library will help position us for changes in the future. I'm not sure we've got a lot of answers, but we hope our experiences are useful to you and interesting to you. I think libraries at times have been leaders in shifting services to digital. Um, at the Turnbull Library, these shifts seem to have happened in clusters, responding to changing societal needs, supporting fund of funding environments, um, and being driven um, through acts of leadership. The first I want to highlight is the shift to provide digital and online access in the early 90s. 30 years ago, in September 1991, staff at the Turnbull Library Manuscripts team made a descriptive record for a recently acquired, acquired extract from a World War II diary of um, Douglas Neil Tiffin. It was the first descriptive record to become available to the public uh, via the library's new online finding aid for archival collections. Just a couple of months later, also in 1991, the National Library of New Zealand went live with Papers Past, the online platform for access to digitised newspapers. The original drivers of the project was a commitment for digitisation to become the primary, primary way to increase access to collections. The Turnbull Library newspaper collection provided the source material for this new service. The content was initially presented by, as digitised images and was later upgraded to include OCR from 2007. That OCR, that optical character recognition, has gradually improved to be over 98% accurate. The site has grown to become one of New the New Zealand government's most used websites with over 50 million page views a year. Um, we're a country of 5 million, so over 50 million page views a year. And in the, former, uh, in the words of former chief historian of New Zealand, Jock Phillips, papers past has changed research in New Zealand. The site has expanded now to include all text-based digitized collections. 
that we have. We're very proud of it and we have an excellent team managing it. Uh, it took a few years, but the archival photographs um, came on, uh, followed newspapers online in 1997 with the time frame service. It started with 8,000 uh, 8, items online, but now the library has several hundred thousand photographs viewable online. The leadership and commitment of, um, I'll just leave it there for a bit. The leadership and commitment of the library staff in the 90s to digitize for online access is commendable. Some truly excellent people helped shift the library from its in-person on-site analog approach to access with all the restrictions and limitations that come with that onto a path of greater online access. These shifts don't just happen. They require strategic leadership, access to appropriate technology and funding, planning and change leadership to achieve the staff buy-in and the change and change the skill sets and behaviors for the shift to be successful. I also highlight them because they represent a strategic shift in thinking that itself has been difficult to shift in recent times. Um, mostly because in making that shift to um, digitization and online access, the library retained control over who got to use collections and how they could be used. That's the shift we're trying to shift again now. Um, so what we're seeing in research and have to respond to is um, the, the change we're seeing in research and have to respond to is one where the researcher wants or even demands online access of copies to use for and as, and as part of their research without or with limited interventions from the library. This type of research is often referred to as the digital humanities, but it certainly isn't limited to humanities. It involves the combining and querying of digital collections from a range of sources to create new modes of inquiry with research output increasingly shared quickly online. We want to be a more active part of this, um, this mode of research, but we're still to determine exactly how that would happen and what active means for the research library of now. We've recently established a library-wide working group on digital research to help us address this question. And I'm really interested in the um, Research Library UK community's perspective on how active or passive um, research libraries of now should be in enabling or participating in digital research. The shift from this passive online access to enabling or participating in use of collections via online channels um, forces us to address some tensions. We, a publicly funded research library, want to meet the needs of many different kinds of users who have different perspectives on what use and reuse of collections is. At the same time, the library relies on collection development from donation by content creators, donors and communities who have a legitimate ongoing need to protect their intellectual rights and property and privacy. Within that space is the amorphous notion of trust how our digital collections are seen to be used and how the library is seen to permit that use influences donors of archives collections, archival collections. Shifting ourselves to support greater use of collections is taking place. Shifting the perspective of the donors of collections so they provide clear permissions that enable greater use is more challenging. Another perspective on the tension is the reality and responsibility of operating in a post-colonial country and context. We're non-Western where non-Western worldviews of culture, intellectual property and privacy are brought more closely to the foreground with online digital services. For the Turnbull Library and the New Zealand context, we have a kaitiakitangaro role, which is most closely translated as guardianship, but that's quite a problematic translation in itself. But we have a role to protect, preserve and make accessible the taonga or cultural heritage relating to Māori. Kaitiakitanga sits alongside and often clashes with Western concepts of intellectual property and privacy and acknowledges that cultural heritage collections have a Māori or life force by way of the people that were involved in their creations. And that Māori doesn't end. This means that it's incumbent on the library to form relationships with Māori on how to care for uh, taonga and cultural heritage and to determine the role that they play in relation to the spiritual care of digitized collections. So things just es escalated quite quickly in the complicated department and that's without going into copyright, which I will leave for another time maybe. But in trying to address these tensions through the 2000s, the library 
implemented a, um, a, a confused approach that has led to some collection items being available on different online channels with different rights, use or copyright statements, which has in turn confused our researchers, our staff and our potential donors. But the important thing for today's discussion is what we've done recently to accelerate our digital shift away from access for access sake and to enable greater use of digital collections outside of the confines of the library and to clear up some of the confusions of the 2000s. In 2014, we released a new use and reuse policy, which attempted to address these tensions outlined earlier and help the library navigate a path forward. The policy principles provided a space that enables the library to release control of use of digital collections where it was appropriate to do so, but also protect use of collections where it is also appropriate to do so. I won't go into the details of the principles. You can find the policy online on the library's website if you're interested, um, netlib.govt.nz um, use policy. We'll, we'll get you there. But the objective of the policy is important, and that's what's on your screen now. We've done some things to achieve this goal. The shift is still taking place. More items are in the public domain. Creative Commons licensing options uh, are now integrated into donor agreements. And we've been working within the rightstatement.org project, especially as rightstatements.org project, especially around including indigenous rights statements within the framework. And um, a big kia ora to our Australian colleagues who have been um, uh, have been great leaders in that space. We believe international responses are important for consistency in this area. However, our biggest success so far, I think, has been the culture change within the library, including at a leadership level, where we are committed to acting towards the objective on your screen. Importantly, also, is that access is not exclusively part of the vision. We've shifted to focus on use. However, in making the shift, we've really only just started. I'm interested in other experiences in this area. Um, the final one I'm going to make today is around um, shifting the point of digitization. Digitization is usually seen as an access or preservation activity focused on existing collections that have usually been in the library for a while. We in the Turnbull Library have an ambition into the future of digitizing everything that's important to New Zealanders, which is a lot. But the library is acquiring analog items at a higher rate than it is digitizing its collections. So the percentage of items digitizing is getting smaller. So the shift we initiated in the last seven years is one where we better integrate digitization at the point of acquisition. I'll give a few examples. In 1982, notable New Zealand photographer Arne Swester deposited her negatives with the, with the library, but they were only here on loan. In 2004, though, the library signed a further agreement with her agents that allowed us to purchase digitized copies of the negatives and that those originals would then finally be donated and owned by the library, and the, so would the digital items. Over a period of five years, Arne's, um, her family and her agents uh, digitized over 80,000 negatives. Importantly, metadata enrichment happened at the same time. To support this shift, we financed the project out of our acquisitions budget, not our digitization budgets. The library also provided the space for the work to take place on site in the library. And I'm aware the shift in financial treatment is not available to many libraries. We're fortunate to have a healthy acquisitions budget despite an incredibly tight and ever shrinking operating budget. The first pilot worked really well and so we keep going. Next up was photographer Max Ertley, a Swiss-born photographer who arrived here when he was 10 years old and has made a significant contribution to New Zealand photography. In 2016, Ertley and the library agreed an arrangement for him to donate his original documentary negatives covering his time here in New Zealand, 1967 to 75, in exchange for a place to work while scanning the negatives and payment for his labor. Essentially, again, we were using our collection budget to pay for a professional photographer to digitize their own collection and donate them to the library. We provide the equipment and space and they provide the collection and importantly, again, the metadata enrich enrichment. Only Max knew when and where he took those photos and who was in them. There were many to choose from, but the quality of the title, David's Birthday Heavy Night, is my favorite. Overall, the project was for about 10,000 images and Max worked in the library part-time over four summers. 
Flying Nun Records is New Zealand's most internationally significant record label. Formed by Roger Shepard in 1991, the label tapped into the local post-punk scene of the 80s and 90s, releasing records, recordings by groups such as The Clean, The Chills, The Bats, and The Valance, Straight Jacket Fits. If you don't know those names, I really recommend you going and spending a bit of time searching through them. In 2018, the Library and Flying Nun Records agreed a donation of over 1,200 tapes, including 750 uh, master recordings on a range of formats to the Library's Archive of New Zealand Music. What made the difference was the condition of the, don the, condition of the donation that committed the Library to digitise these tapes within four years and make them available to the label for reissuing, remastering or doing whatever they want with. The library retained the original tapes and the ownership of the original tapes and the digitized masters. This was the implementation of a strategic shift in focus for the archives of New Zealand Music, where we considered utilizing the infrastructure, objectives and purposes of the library as a mechanism to be the archive of independent music in New Zealand, to ensure that a wide range of our music heritage could be preserved and made accessible through time. There's no way these independent labels, music labels, were going to be able to digitize their own back catalogs and reissue and make use of them again. And as we all know, magnetic media is degrading. Um, speaking of AV, and this is a very brief aside, um, in last year's budget in New Zealand, uh, the National Library, the Film and Sound Archive, and Archives New Zealand, the National Archives, received funding to digitise the entire government's audiovisual collections. It's about over 500,000 items. And um, so we're just in the process of setting up with a vendor in New Zealand um, who can perform that at that scale and um, also then maybe use them to digitize all AV in New Zealand. That's uh, maybe a topic for another talk. Um, and finally, um, just recently, um, the library in fulfilling one of its uh, collection priorities on 20th century architectural plans, agreed an acquisition and digitization of an entire set of plans by architect John Scott. It's about 10,000 items. John Scott was a notable New Zealand architect of Te Arawa and Pākehā descent, who's known for successfully integrating European and Māori concepts into his design. Um, this is my favourite building in Wellington, the Fituna Chapel. So they were four examples. Um, we're now trying to shift our business model to incorporate this approach more into our acquisition decision making. At this stage, we can only run a couple of acquisition digitization projects a year, but hopefully the conceptual shift has happened. Digitization is part of acquisition, and we start to invest more in this approach. The option to digitize at the point of acquisition does assist the library with conversations with donors, especially those big notable collections um, and discussions that we all, we all have with our, with our important big donors that can take years to reach a successful conclusion. But this is just one aspect of the shifts in collecting and collection development that we're seeing. That's all for me. I'm just going to hand over to Jess really quickly and she'll continue. So carrying on the collection building theme that Mark was um, talking about, certainly I think for all of us, collection development and appraisal writ large is draws through much of what we do in research libraries. Um, and while our original founders mandate around collecting priorities and our ongoing legislative uh, requirements have continued to frame our collection development work, over time, I think that appraisal and how we make those collection development decisions has shifted a bit. Um, and this isn't only a digital shift, but digital technologies since you know, the mid 20th century at least have certainly proliferated the growth of records and, and challenged our ability to preserve and manage them over time. And digital's only exasperated this. So I think as a profession um, around the world, or at least you know, many research libraries, we've been grappling for the last 10 to 15 years over how to effectively manage our collections, especially in the face of growing backlogs of our uncatalogued or unprocessed material. Um, and while there's a growing body of work out there that's trying to figure out how we can manage and efficiently and effectively process this material, um, we know that much of that work starts at appraisal um, and we, what we decide to collect and bring in. And um, here, just as an aside, just I think last week as we were reviewing the draft for this, OCLC released a new report on the total cost of stewardship for responsible collection building in archives and special collections. Um, 
And it's really great to see that work and to see the kind of support from the community starting to think about these things. Uh, and so we've only had a quick squint skim, but I think that a lot of the thinking outlined in there is also the kind of thinking that we're doing here at the Turnbull Library. Um, but before I fully shift into some of our thinking around appraisal and collection building, I thought it would be useful to take a look back at um, the library's growth uh, in our digital preservation and digital collecting capability um, and how that has kind of framed where we've gone to from there. So um, our ability to be able to actually collect digital material has really grown over the last 15 years. Um, and a lot of that has been down to the development of our and the development and the implementation of the Rosetta Digital Preservation System or the NDHA, the National Digital Heritage Archive, as we call it here. Um, and that's so it's not just the system, but it's also all the supporting infrastructure, um, the policy and business rules, the the entire kind of system that sits around how we manage and preserve our digital collections. Um, development of the NDHA began in 2004 and it was officially launched in 2008. Um, like I said, it's not just the system. The system is extremely important and forms the core, but there's a lot of sort of the architecture around it, how it connects to our collection management systems, our storage systems, our ingest, different ingest mechanisms. Um, and as important, if not more important, is all the technical and digital specialists who work on the system um, and make sure that we're able to, to keep using the system, keep it keeps up to date, we keep kind of refreshing it and updating as we go. So responsibility for most of this work sits in another part of the National Library, but it's really core to our ability within the Turnbull to do our work. And we're lucky to be able to collaborate uh, with the digital preser preservation team. Without our ability, like I said, both the systems and the staff capabilities to store and preserve digital collections, our ability to collect would be severely hampered. Um, and as an aside, I thought it would be worth noting that with the establishment of the Digital Heritage Archive, it also led to establishment you know, of quite a number of new roles in the library. There was, There is the whole team, the preservation research and consultancy team that um, manages the preservation system. Um, as well as within the Turnbull, we, we uh, um, established additional roles for an additional digital archivist, web archivists, um, and arrangement and description librarian archivists to work with uh, foreign digital and digitized collections specifically. So having that system in place and the investment in st staff cap capability to acquire, arrange, describe, and ingest into that preservation system has meant that we've had a sustained digital collecting practice for over 15 years. Since then, we've been collecting hybrid and born digital manuscript and archives material, born digital photographs, music, and oral history. Um, we've also been in a really fortunate position, as Mark mentioned, to be able to collaborate internationally around uh, our digital preservation tools. Um, and one of the really successful collaborations we've had over time is with the web curator tool. Uh, first in the original development of it with the British Library and more recently with the National Library of the Netherlands. Um, this is our main tool for being able to archive websites. So we have done some really great work during this period to grow our capabilities to collect and preserve digital materials. Um, and I think what, over time, we've learned a couple things. Um, the first, as Mark was uh, hinting at with the different kinds of access, we really learned that uh, our researchers always want more access um, and that our access is always, you know, we're, we're always having to keep up and catch up with the kind of access that is demanded by researchers. Um, and the second is that while we've made some strides to increase the diversity and the representation um, of New Zealanders in our collections, our web and digital and our web and digital collections have helped with that. We still aren't doing as much as we would like um, or as we need to do to meet our ambition, which is to have um, our collections represent the diversity of New Zealand and the Pacific. So Mark has already briefly discussed some of our thinking around access, and I'll come back to that briefly at the end. But first, some more about collection um, building. 
So the collecting history of the Trimble Library, I think, is quite similar to other libraries like it. It was established, as Mark mentioned, through the early collecting of its namesake, Alexander Turnbull, who was a wealthy Wellingtonian who was an avid book and manuscript collector. The early days of the library as a public institution focused on building to the strengths of Turnbull's early collection. And that really kind of set the tone and the scope for the culture and the perception of the library. It was this um, research library for the culture and political and academic elite, formal academic study. Um, by the 1970s, these interests um, of, of what we were and how we were, what we were collecting and who we were serving had begun to shift. And while the library continued to build to its traditional strengths, strengths there were also efforts to build collections in previously underrepresented areas, including the role of women in New Zealand society, labor history, the role of religion in everyday life. Um, this image here is one that um, Mark originally found, but we both really like because it's actually the, the kind of the internal library records of pr early proactive collecting initiatives in the 1970s and 80s and the letters from the then chief librarian um, reaching out to different organizations and community groups and saying, we'd like to, you know, come talk to us about collecting in your organization. We think it's important. So, um, that was happening really through the 70s and 80s. And then if we skip ahead to the early 2000s for a variety of reasons, that proactive and targeted collecting uh, history dropped off a bit, but there was a shift made uh, with a, more of a focus on online and internet collecting uh, because of the web ability to web, do web archiving. Born digitally collecting, particularly first through web archiving, was hinting that our work to expand the representation of material in the library's collections was due for a refresh um, and that we could leverage and learn from our ability to collect born digital material. So when the library first started web archiving, it increasingly saw the function as an opportunity to document the existence of individuals and community organizations that were using websites to connect with their people. Um, these were often people and communities that you wouldn't other otherwise see in the library's collections. So we, we very much as a library saw that as part of its mandate, but I think web archiving was also a really convenient way for us to collect in areas where we might not otherwise have had inroads. So this is just one example from the photography blog, click, 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 and it's by New Zealand born Samoan artist and photographer, um, Ramoni. He was a self-titled photographer, um, and the blog documents the graffiti and hip hop culture in South Auckland. So, um, you know, as we've been collecting really for 15 or more years in our web archives, there really at this point are a massive um, and largely undertapped uh, resource for research, really ready for study and analysis. And I think that is, um, people are starting now, there's enough distance from the early web that people are starting to understand that this is uh, a, a great source for research and an important collection. And I think that's been really gratifying to the team of web archivists who've been working on this collection quite um, as a small team that nobody really understood what they got. And it's really great to see people starting to interact with this collection um, and see the, the power of it. So, um, but for us really the next question is how were we going to take what we had learned from our online collecting and move towards um, making our collections, if we can, um, more representative and inclusive more broadly than just in our web archiving collections. So the first step in this was a major revision and update of the library's collections policies uh, that started the collection policy in 2015. So in the interest of time, I won't go into a huge amount of detail. Um, and like our access and use policy, uh, if you love a good policy, you can find our collections policy and our collection plans um, online on our website. Uh, but essentially what we wanted to acknowledge in this was that we needed to continue building to our existing strengths, but we wanted to lower that priority a little bit and make sure that the voices that we weren't seeing we um, put some resource and some effort into making sure that the library was a trusted place. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were balancing that sort of the significant paper mountains um, with the digital collections and 
we were resourcing and understanding what that total cost of stewardship was to bring in these large collections um, and that we made choices based on that total stewardship so that we could start to deal with um, the backlogs of collections that were coming in and not being uh, processed, managed for many years because they were so big. Um, and finally, I think most in, one of the really important things uh, that Mark talked a little bit about was working collaboratively to achieve big goals. I think it was a, a really important shift in the library to think about uh, our place as one of the kind of nodes in the documentary heritage network um, and that we need to be collaborating with our colleagues both across Aotearoa and internationally to achieve the kind of ambitions for what we want to achieve. So, um, like I said down there, one of the ones that we do want to keep dealing with and investing in was our ability to collect um, and increase our digital collecting capability more generally. So, um, like I was saying, we've learned a lot from web archiving, but web archiving and um, websites themselves are not static. And so we're constantly having to adapt and find new tools and ways to collect uh, online documentary heritage. So social media has been a huge challenge for the library. Our traditional web archiving tools, such as web curator tool, um, weren't designed in the age of social media. And they, you know, social media has been difficult for us to capture using those tools. So we've um, spent a lot of time in the last few years trying to understand how we can better collect from social media and what exactly that means. And in developing new responses to social media, we're not only grown our digital skills, but I think had to learn and apply our archival, ethical, and appraisal practices to a new format and vice versa. And what I mean by this is that social media is a great one for blurring the lines between the published and the unpublished sections um, and between individual and the collective, public and private. So making confident decisions in this area really requires strong digital skills, but also strong appraisal skills. Um, so it's just as there's been an explosion of paper records, there's definitely been a similar explosion in digital content and a corresponding need for a thoughtful appraisal. And we know that just kind of trying to collect everything is an abdication of our responsibility in the same way that having huge piles of paper that we don't do anything would be, do anything with would be an abdication of our responsibility. So um, rather than go into a lot of detail about our social media collecting, um, because there's colleagues in the library who could do a much better job of that than I could, I thought I would just talk to you short, briefly about um, one collection that brings together some of our social media but also um, the kind of work we're trying to do around working with communities to collect. So this is an image from the We Are the Beneficiaries project. Um, briefly, in the wake of a former Green Party co-leader, uh, Matir Turai's resignation following statements about her history as a beneficiary in 2017, a group of artists mobilized to create art to share their experiences um, as beneficiaries in the hopes of continuing that conversation. Over time, artists um, and anonymous people sent in their own experience, and then artists would illustrate that with, um, so this is an example of somebody sends in a story, and an, and an artist creates some sort of image about that story, um, and then they would be shared on social media. So they had a Facebook, Instagram, and um, Twitter accounts, and they would share these stories um, on social media and get feedback, and they would just become really viral um, and so we worked with the We Are the Beneficiaries group um, to make sure that the artist perspectives and the stories shared, not to mention the artworks themselves, that um, could be collected and held in the Turnbull Library. And I think what was really interesting about this, it was allowed us to use the, the capability that we had around social media collecting, but also understanding of archives. So we didn't just collect the social media, we collected the correspondence and the background work around um, creating the artwork. And also there was a lot of work done to make sure that because there was a lot of anonymous peoples and their personal private stories, um, that we had appropriate levels of access for the different kinds of content.
So when discussing the acquisition, the library was very conscious that the depictions of the beneficiaries in the collection um, up to that point were dominated by the collection previously known as the Cartoon Archive of New Zealand. Um, and here you can see a few examples of what I mean. Sort of clearly kind of biased and negative representations of beneficiaries. So um, bringing the We Are the Beneficiaries collection into the library and the library being a mechanism for making sure that story was preserved and available to people, um, allowed for another voice to be heard, another version of the story of what it is to um, be on a benefit in New Zealand. So, but I think this is also not only to highlight the cartoon archive, but to a little segue to a change that we have recently made in the New Zealand Cartoon Archive. We've rescoped it to now be the New Zealand Cartoon and Comics Archive, and the new expanded scope reflects the library's focus on a wider variety of cartoon and comic art forms to reflect New Zealand's increasingly diverse communities. Um, so as the library heads into its second hundred years, it's clear that we need to shift who we are and how we operate if an increasingly diverse New Zealand is to develop and maintain a comprehensive collection of documents of itself and its people, which is a slight shift of our legislative mandate to put the um, emphasis on the collections actually belonging to the people of New Zealand. Um, and in discussing sort of how we want to do this, Mark and I've had a lot of conversations and really what, you know, coming to think about what are the key principles that would underpin this kind of work, which is about making sure that there's social, you know, that the library is working towards that goal of social inclusion and justice. And that the, the way to do that is through a sense of empathy, partnership and participation. And those should be the, the way that the library operates. Um, and that that empathetic participatory library shifts its collecting focus towards co-creating com with communities um, and sees itself as part of a larger network, not as the place. Um, and where the power for making those archival decisions is transferred or at least shared with the communities and perspectives that um, are outside the institution. So the mechanisms for how we, we do that are, are, are open for debate and we're still working on this. But I think um, we have made some small steps that I think we're, we're quite proud of. Um, and some of these have been, so with this new comic and cartoon archive, we have established an advisory committee and this group um, is newly established last year. And the aim is to have a diverse group of participating artists, historians, and others who are active in the field work with the library and to provide us with advice and connections to networks that we might not already have. Um, the second is the establishment of a new curatorial role specifically to deal with and spend time building those relationships, a focus of the role and the small team we're building um, within that with that role is not simply the acquisition of more material from more people, but rather to ensure that there's permanent resource and a permanent role in the library that focuses on looking at our current collecting activities and noticing how well or not we're doing to meet our stated priorities and taking the time to work with communities and organizations to, as we said, co-create um, that participatory library that we want to see. So while the word digital isn't really part of that, um, we, we know we need to have a range of digital skills to be able to engage in this space. And the current shifts we're going through the library um, are digital in a way that spans both the technical and the social cultural axis um, we respond to what we're seeing and happening in the world around us, both digitally and culturally. And I think at this point, the two are so closely bound together as to be really difficult to bring apart. Um, so one last bit about access before we um, open it to questions. When we were thinking about this talk, as I said, we kept going back to the decisions we make about collecting um, and how they impact the work and how the needs and the desires and the demands of our researchers need to inform um, and impact how we provide access and use to the collections. Because it really is um, when people are, collections are activated, they become alive and real. When people use them, when people make meaning out of them, um, they're no good just sitting in our stores. So as Mark mentioned at the beginning of this talk, we first started putting our finding aids online through an online searchable database in the 1990s. 
Um, and then that original database was actually maintained and was our collections management system until around 2016 when we migrated our data to a new, more modern, modern and systems driven, standards driven system. Um, so this is just a view of our, our current, the, the public view of our current collections management system. Um, and just wanted to briefly highlight that one of the things that was really important to us and that we're then working through now is having a system that we could be compliant with international standards. Um, and in, th in this case, international encoding standards, specifically EAD and EAC CPF. So we knew in the short term, this would help us to make sure that we were standardizing our descriptive practice across formats within the library um, to make material easier to find for researchers. But also um, thinking a little bit further, we wanted to be able to share our descriptive data more widely and make sure that we were well prepared to contribute to national and international initiatives to make these our collections more findable. So, so far this has taken the form of making our entire, our name authorities, data records available through um, places like Wiki, Wikidata. Um, and we also have them on our data page, you could download our entire descriptive or name authority files. Um, so, we also want, and we're really starting to, and we're really excited about being able to contribute and participate in international research and projects that are looking to explore how we can connect our collections to each other and to researchers. So internationally at the moment, we're participating in things like OCLC's um, research into entity data management um, and some other linked open data initiatives. But at the same time as we're exploring that, we're also exploring the ethical limits of this kind of international international sharing. So how do Maori and indigenous data sovereignty more broadly fit within our sort of Western worldview that privileges more and open access? And can we hold and honor both views as a research library working at the National Library um, in a library committed to a bicultural partnership? So these are some of the issues that we're working through right now, but we know if we get it right, um, we'll have made a really important step. Um, so I think I will stop there um, because we're running out of time and I can talk forever. Mark and I both realized we could talk um, <laughs> so much to share, um, but just to say thank you. And I think that we, the thing that we know is that this international sharing, um, sharing perspectives and working together is where we know we need to go to be able to solve some of these big problems. Kia ora. Thank you so Thank much, you so Jess and Mark. Yes. Um, it has been such an enriching talk and I was totally absorbed in all of the <laughs> initiatives that you were mentioning that I've, I was completely lost track of time as well. So thank you again, <laughs> both Mark and, and Jess. We've had a huge number of questions. And so if I may, uh, one, ask that we can keep answers short because then we'll be able to go through a wide range of questions. But also, if, if the lovely audience can give us a few extra minutes, I think that would be great. But we, we will try to go through them as, as much as possible. So I've, I've kind of themed them. And the first theme that's coming through is a strategy. And particularly, there's a question about uh, that the main aim of digitization is at uh, providing access. And uh, considering you've talked about your whole journey in this over, over a long period of time, how has your digitization agenda and your digitization strategy changed with the changing digital context around you and with the changing uh, user needs and their expectations? Mm. Yeah, do you want uh, me to take that one, Jess? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, there's uh, a few things. Like quickly, we're, we're trying to address digitization priorities as a, as a country and a, and a, and a, and a system. Um, so working together with our co colleagues on sort of um, on, on national and regional priorities for digitization, then working together to ensure that the digital collections relating to those priorities that come from our various institutions can be digitized. So there's much more sort of cohesive thinking there. Um, we know, as I said, that researchers want fewer interventions from the library um, in relating to, to use. So we, we try and focus on things that enable greater use. Um, and also we're really trying to scale up. As I said, the percentage of items digitized is shrinking. Um, 
um, but that's difficult and that requires um, appropriate funding and, and that hasn't been easy for us at the moment. So we've, we've, we've got a plan to transform um, our, the scale of our digitization, but um, we're still working through exactly how that's going to be funded, but we have some plans. That's great. Thank you so much, Mark. And if I may um, follow up on that with another question, which is, um, I think, Mark, you mentioned when you were speaking that um, uh, there's a question that you want to pose back, which is how active and passive research libraries should be in relation to digital research and scholarship. Uh, I'm just curious about your own view on that. What do you think how active or passive we should be? Um, um, uh Damn, that was a question for you guys. <laughs> um, um, I think I think it's um, it's a little bit of both. We need to be quite clever about it. We can't be really active all the time. It's just impossible from a resourcing perspective. But I think there's a role that research libraries play in the research community and with research methods that I think with this notion of digital humanities, I think we need to be a very active player in enabling and activating digital humanities and making sure that what we do as research libraries and what the research communities does do, sorry, is um, sort of activated and accelerated. And so I think our role is to be quite active in, 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 in really establishing that kind of research. Mm -hmm. Once it's established, I think we've got a role to probably step back a little bit, but we'll understand that further. Um, so I think it's a little bit, uh, it kind of depends on how active or passive. I think we just need to be careful and clever about wh which parts of the research system in general we're, we're active about. That's very helpful. And uh, Jess, I wonder if you would want to come, back, uh, come on to another question, which is linked, which is, uh, do you provide any digital tools available to researchers at this time? to support their journey in that digital humanities agenda to work collaboratively with you on research projects? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. And I think the answer is mostly not really. Um, we, that Mark mentioned the digital research working group and some of that has been around exploring, you know, what are the tools that we should be and how should we kind of position ourselves? Um, and our first step was actually realizing that we had um, some data sets and open data in a lot of different places on the website and we didn't have it in a centralized place and we didn't actually have it. We had it in our like policy area as opposed to research. So the first step has just been um, creating a page on our research area about this, this is where our data, our open data sets lives. And these are the kind of data that we have and then providing some initial um, goals on, or initial instructions on how to use the different kinds of data sets. But in terms of actual digital tools, we haven't done that yet. Um, it, it is, a, again, I think about resourcing and prioritizing some of that digital, digital work. Um, and so we're hoping that the group that's working on it now will kind of start to give us some priorities of where we should focus in on some of that work. Thank you so much. That's very well put as well. Um, I think we should move to the next theme of the topics, which is about diversity and inclusion. So uh, I think the first one is for you, Jess, which is about uh, given the fact of increasing diversity in the library's digital collection uh, as part of your overall strategy, mm. um, uh, how would you frame the best practices in regards to your collection development practices? Uh, for engendering diversity of voices in the collection overall? I think, um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I think that I'm not sure we have best practices that we've really established. I think what we, um, like we were, I was speaking about is that it's about building those relationships. Um, one of the things that we, we know when we were, we could collect a lot of websites and social media because it was, quite easy, it was on the internet, um, and we didn't necessarily have to have the deep relationships with people um, to build that trust and that sense that it, you know, people wanted to put their collections into the Turnbull Library. So I think um, the, first, the first thing that we have really recognized is that relationships are really important to this process. Um, and I mean, we've had I think for a really long time and the Trimble Library has been really good at that, this really strong um, 
uh, with having the staff Maori specialists across the library um, in the Turnbull in different areas. So uh, Maori curators, um, outreach people, uh, research services, people that oral history, people that can um, talk. And so we can learn a lot from how, how we have developed partnerships um, with Maori and expand that to other communities that we have missed. So I think uh, really what we're trying to do at this point is, um, you know, know that good practice is not just going out and trying to grab a bunch of stuff and bring it back to the library because, and then we can tick that box. Good practice is uh, really changing the, the people's perspective of the library as a place that is theirs as well and that they belong to um, so that they have that sense of, of wanting to be part of the library. Yeah, absolutely. I think digital and collections are the easy part. It's the sustainability of those relationships which really matters in the long run. Yeah, totally. Um, looking at a different element of inclusion, uh, there's a question about how you're engaging younger people or those that might feel mm -hmm. excluded from formal places like libraries, um, especially because they can feel quite intimidating to some, mm -hmm. some audiences. Uh, do you work with schools? Do you, do you ensure that your digital collections are embedded in the school curriculum somewhere else? Uh, any, any ideas or approaches on that? Yeah, um, the library has a whole direct, the National Library of New Zealand has a whole directorate called Services to Schools, um, um, which sort of came out of the old school library service that we used to run here. Uh, we we kind of have a, I, I think we have mixed success in this area. Um, we have this fantastic, so part of that service, they, um, they, they, they curate and create kind of digital collections based on themes around the curricula and make that available, available via the web and they make it available to teachers as well. And so the services to school directorate of the National Library really very much sees themselves as part of the, of the education system. It's actually funded by the Ministry of Education, but delivered by the National Library of New Zealand. Um, um, we have also this online service called Any Questions, and it's the, sort of the infrastructure and support for it's provided by the National Library. But what it is is a service by which um, students from around the country can connect with librarians from around the country online between 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Um, and so look it up on our website. It's called Any Questions National Library. And so we have librarians staff it from around the country. And so, so, so kids can sort of address their questions there. Um, and that was in 100% acknowledging the barriers around um, the physical barriers and the sort of mental barriers and all sorts of barriers that, ex that exist that prevent kids coming to libraries. Um, so, so that's a great service and, um, and, and it's, it's still a very popular service. That's such a fantastic idea, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure, like myself, others are thinking about stealing this idea as well. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, I will move on to the next category, and I absolutely uh, acknowledge that there are just so many questions coming in. This just shows how, how enthusiastic people are, but uh, we'll try to cover as many as possible. I think there's a question about, um, realistically speaking, um, you can't meet all of the researchers' needs and demands instantaneously. And I think probably for this one is for Jess because you were talking about the appraisal policies, Jess. Uh, what are your policies around prioritization for those needs? Uh, if you can briefly highlight some of those. Um, appraisal priorities, is that? Uh, or more in this context, more about digitization priorities and how do you decide which uh, things to digitize first? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's a, um, uh, in, our, in our most recent, um, our, our sort of strategic directions that we established, we have this one um, strategic goal, which causes us consternation on how we're gonna get there, which is digitize everything important to New Zealanders. Um, and it's a lot. Um, and what, what does important exactly mean? Um, and so one of the first things that we really did was we sat down and, um, and kind of came up with a little bit of a matrix of priorities. Um, and, and we did tie that to collection development. So seeing that building, digitizing and building um, our digital collections was like, even though there are collections we already had, it was also a collection development um, exercise because we were making these digital collections available. So tying it to our 
uh, collecting plan priorities and then also tying it to, so we kind of had a, like a matrix of, is it, is it quite important um, in terms of the priorities that we have set for collecting? Uh, how, how, how open is the access? How difficult is it gonna be to provide access? Um, how difficult is it actually gonna be to digitize the material in terms of the format is quite complicated. It's, um, so how, how much, you know, bank and black, how, how, what's the conservation? Either does it really need to be digitized because it's um, quite popular and it's sort of falling apart from too much handling or alternatively is, is there so much conservation that would need, be, need to be done on this item that it, it wouldn't be that high on the list? And so um, use and then kind of rating it against some of those priorities uh, and then seeing what kind of falls to the top of the pile. Um, and that was a process, and that's a process that we kind of go through every six months and see what our plan is and then have a bigger plan for the year. Um, and it works across, so it's not just one team that does that. We have curatorial um, arrangement and description, archivist, research reference staff, um, and conservators look at that. And that, that helps us within the Turnbull to decide um, what our priorities are gonna be from year to year to digitize. That's a very well balanced approach. And I appreciate that we are uh, running over time now. So if we can just take one last question and with uh, sincere apologies to everyone who's asked questions which we haven't been able to cover, I'm sure we will get some responses at a, at a later stage from <laughs> Mark and Jess and I hope you, you will allow us to do so. But if I, if I may pick on a last question, which is um, digitization. I think Mark, you were probably mentioning this, that digitization at the point of acquisition is a really mm -hmm. bold step. And uh, the, the question is, how do you make it sustainable? Do you, um, is funding for digitization something that you discuss with the donors at the time you're acquiring it? And is that both for creating of digital surrogates, but also for its preservation in the long run? Yeah, great question. Um, it's interesting that it's seen as bold because we just kind of like came up with it and thought it was a good idea and just kind of kept running with it <laughs> and it just kept working. <laughs> um, um, no, um, no, that's I'm underselling it. Um, there's, there's a lot there. Is it sustainable? Um, not yet. Um, we have, um, as I said, we have a relatively healthy acquisitions budget and, and um, a very challenging operational budget. And so that was part of the shift that we took if we saw digitization as part of the acquisition um, and made it a condition of acquisition, we could shift some of our, some of our funding around. And so that sort of helped us with scale. Um, it's also made us ask the question around sustainability. As I said, there's only a, only one or two that we can do a year. So we're really picking on those flagship acquisitions where we think we're going to get that digitization benefit immediately. Um, um, the conversations, it really helps, I would say, with those the, the, the conversations we had, for example, with the Flying Nun Records, um, record label conversation, our ability to digitize immediately and sort of bake that into the into the contract into the acquisition contract was such a strategic advantage and and, and it, it, it brought the entire community of musicians that sits behind that collection along with us and um that really that was actually the third record label we've with um, um but by far and away the most complicated that 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 we have um we've provided that service for so um, sustainable, not yet. Um, more likely to be sustainable because it's part of acquisition. Yes, I think so. We're still traveling that path and making the shift. Um, but the um, understanding digitization within the whole sort of value chain and the whole sort of life cycle of our collections and pushing it further to the front, uh, I think is potentially quite a significant shift that will, that will change our business model. We're not there yet. We're kind of in the process of doing that.